So now, let's begin to consider electric current. We already have now a concept of voltage. The last concept we need to really begin to think about circuits is current. So as we begin to think about current, I want you to imagine that I have some chunk of material. It's going to be like a wire. I'm going to draw it here with a rectangular cross section. You can choose whatever cross section might uh, most suit you. It, it really doesn't matter for the uh, arguments that we're about to make. So I want to consider this long rectangular chunk of material. So here I'm going to draw here. You know how you, you draw your classic rectangle here uh, off at an angle like so. Make sure to make the other lines here dashed lines. So it's going to look a little bit like a parallelogram. Get everybody to line up nicely. And now we're looking here from the front so we can draw then our first you know, line across this long um, uh, chunk of material that we're going to draw. And now we're going to draw something that parallels this back face. So it's going to come up like this, like so. And then I can finish the top part of this uh, surface like that. Then I can begin to come down to the same point I'd come down to for the other side. Bring this one here across. So I've got this nice chunk of material. And I'm going to consider now what I need to do in order to begin to get a current. Here, I'll draw this dash line on the back. In order to get a current to flow through this thing. Well, if I want my charge carriers in here, to flow down this wire. Clearly there's going to have to be some kind of an electric field here inside of this material. So I'm going to draw that the electric field then that's going to be in there. It's going to be driving my charges. It's going to look something like this. A nice say constant straight electric field that's in there ready to drive my particles forward down through my wire. Now, first thought, you should be saying to yourself, wait a minute, Professor Aria. You've just said that in uh, uh, previous discussions that we can't have an electric field inside a conducting material. How is it that now there is one? Well, remember, what we were saying about the electric field is that uh, there can be initially, but it's going to start to drive the motion of charges. And it will drive the motion of charges until we build up charges on the surface that will stop the flow at hand. If this were the only thing we had in our circuit, right, just this electric field applied to this chunk of material, then yes, right away, we would end up with currents that would finally build up, actually, if we think about it, on this side, a little bubble for our thinking here, a bunch of positive charges on this side of the wire. And similarly, a whole bunch of uh, minus charges would be left over on this side of the wire. And these plus charges and these minus charges would then start to generate an electric field pointing in the opposite direction, away from the positives and towards the minuses. And eventually, we would generate an electric field here that would cancel this imposed electric field. And we would indeed end up with zero electric field inside. But this is key as to what actually makes a circuit. Right? What we're going to do is we are not going to allow positive charges to build up on this face. What we're going to do is to, to complete a, a, a circuit. It's called right, a cycle through which um, current can flow. So ultimately, we're not going to talk about it uh, at the moment, but ultimately we're going to connect something to this front face and something here to this back face and do something so that the charges here would then be allowed to flow back around the system so that we never have that buildup of charge that we're familiar with from what's called electrostatics where everybody gets to settle down. We're not going to allow that buildup to happen. So there will be still inside of here some electric field. Now that we see that this is an allowable situation, let's put a couple parameters on this and then begin to do some type of analysis to figure out how much current will actually flow. To answer that, we will need to know what the uh, cross-sectional area A is here of our faces. And also, we will want to know the length of our wire. And I will call this length here capital L. All right, now, if we set this situation up and just quickly switch on this electric field, there's a particular sequence of events that will happen 
And if we think carefully through the sequence of events, we will be able to determine, in fact, exactly how much current will flow down through this system. So the first thing that's going to happen, the first instant we turn on this electric field is that any mobile carriers here inside of this conducting material are going to feel a force and therefore an acceleration. So that's the first thing we're going, we're going to see. The charges, all the charges in fact are going to feel a force, but we're mostly concerned about the mobile charges in particular will feel some force F, and the force on those charges we know is, are going to be Q, the amount, the amount of charge on each one of them, times E, where E then is the electric field. And when they feel that force, they will feel that force and accelerate. Now, they will either accelerate, of course, to the right if they're positive along the electric field, or to the left if they happen to be negative against the electric field. At the end of the day, we'll see, though, that the current we get will be independent of the sign of the charge carriers, because we know backward motion of negative charges is equivalent to forward motion of positive charges. OK, so we're going to have that uh, acceleration. But now, as they begin to accelerate, they, that can't go on to infinity. Right? We can't just end up with infinite velocities. In real life, something is going to slow down these charge carriers. They are going to begin to experience some kind of a drag force. So at, once they reach high speed, so at high speed, high speed for them, it may not be what we might consider high speed, but at higher speeds, maybe I should better say, at higher speeds, right? They begin to experience drag, and now what I'm about to write down, this drag force, F sub D, D for drag, is not actually a, a law of physics. It's an empirical observation, but it turns out that to a very good approximation, in almost all materials that you will encounter at the normal types of electric fields that you find, inside of electrical circuits, that that drag force actually is in inverse proportion to the velocity. So it is proportional to the velocity that the particles have. There's some proportionality constant, which I will call B for this drag force. And the force, of course, is going to be in the opposite direction of the velocity because, it, because it's a drag force. It's trying to slow down this motion. So there is always inevitably there going to be some kind of a minus sign. So as they accelerate and go faster and faster, this drag force will increase and become higher and higher, and it will continue increasing until the force from the drag is going to exactly match right the force that they are feeling directly, the force, I'm sorry, the force that they are feeling directly from the uh, electric field. So they will eventually, stage C, they're going to reach what is called a terminal velocity. You might recall this from various examples that you usually will find in mechanics class, where you drop an object and gravity tries to accelerate it with some constant force, much like our electric field will be doing, but the air resistance produces a drag force and eventually you reach some maximum velocity. And where that we reach that terminal velocity, the condition for that, of course, is that there is no more acceleration, so that the sum of the forces on the particle then would be zero. And in this case, the two forces that contribute are the electrical force coming from the electric field, Q times E. But then there is also this drag force, which has value minus the drag constant B, times the velocity v. And now we have a uh, nice little equation that we can solve. We can solve this for the velocity of these particles. You would add this term to both sides of the equation. So we would have bv equals qe. And then we can solve by dividing through by b. 
and that will just tell us then finally that the um, velocity that we will reach at the final condition is going to be this QE divided by B. So it'll be QE, that was the force, the electric force, divided by that drag coefficient D. Very good. So this uh, velocity, by the way, we, we end up calling the drift velocity. Because while the particles are moving through here, they might be colliding off of various things, and it's those collisions that uh, give us this effect of this drag. But the final overall motion of the particles through here is called the drift velocity. We usually give it a subscript uh, D like that. And uh, that tells us now what the motion of our uh, particles are going to be. So we now have a very good microscopic view of how the system is going to respond in terms of the applied electric field and the uh, drift velocity that the uh, charge carriers are going to exhibit. We would like really though, because when we analyze circuits, we usually aren't you know, thinking about the atoms and the electrons, right? We think about more, a more macroscopic view of what's going on. So, so far what I've given you here is the microscopic view. Macroscopically, what we're going to be uh, dealing with is the uh, net amount of current that flows down our wire. And potentially, rather than thinking about the electric field inside the wire, we might want to think about the voltage across the wire. So let's now try to get this uh, into a more uh, expressed in terms of more macroscopic quantities. So if we, if we think that way, a more macro view, and begin to think about the flow of the current, I'd like you to recall some of our past discussion about fluid flow or the flow of any quantity that's conserved. In this case, it's charge that conserve, is conserved. And you recall then that our key formula there was that the current flowing across any area patch, any area delta A, right, with a, a, a particular orientation, right, is given by this current density vector J dotted with that particular area vector where that area vector, as you will recall, it corresponds to the area through which we are counting the flow. In this case, we're counting the current that's arriving at this final face that then would flow through the rest of our circuit. And the, uh, the area vector then is the actual area A times the normal vector to the surface. So in this case, I'm drawing a nice perpendicular vector. That would be the normal vector would be pointing off in that direction. And the area vector then is the scalar area value times that unit vector. So the A vector also points in that outward direction. We also had not just this formula for the overall final current. We also had a nice formula which would tell us the current density J. We were told that that would equal the density of the conserved quantity, right? In this case, it's going to be charge per unit volume, rho, times the velocity v. For us, this velocity is this terminal velocity that we've just calculated, v sub d. This uh, charge density, rho, this is really the charge density of the mobile carriers, right? This is the density of the flowing conserved quantity. That would be measured then as uh, uh, charge, mobile charge, let me call it mobile charge per unit volume. And we can compute that then by looking at the uh, charge on each of our carriers, so charge per carrier times the number of carriers, the number of these charge carriers per unit volume. Now, the charge per carrier, that is this quantity Q. That is the quantity, the charge on each carrier, 
right? That's how we actually were able to compute the force that each carrier felt by multiplying its charge by the electric field. The carrier's per unit volume, that's going to be some kind of a property of our particular material. That's going to be measured in a number density, number per unit volume. That's usually called N, right? Uh, that's density per volume, so that's going to be number per volume. So now we know what the various contributions are here to J, so let's substitute those in. The, uh, the, uh, char the mobile charge density, right, the flow of what we're trying to uh, count up is going to equal then charge per volume, it will be Q times this density of carriers per volume, so that's N times Q, we're substituting in for rho. The drift velocity here, we had a nice expression for it, was proportional to the charge times then the electric field, E, and then divided by this drag coefficient, which makes sense, of course, right? The more drag we have, the slower our drift velocity would become. And now we can combine our terms here and we get an interesting expression. We get that it's the density of the carriers. Good, we'd get more flow if we had more density. Times, this is interesting, Q squared divided by the drag coefficient B and then times the electric field E. What has me very excited is that this thing goes like Q squared, right? I don't know if the carriers are positive or negative. But when they get squared, I end up with a net positive quantity. So what this equation finally tells me is that the flow of the current is always going to be some positive number times the electric field. The current will always flow in exactly the same direction of the electric field, whether the charges happen to be positive or if they happen to be negative. So the final result of all of this is usually characterized in the following equation. The, we usually write, because from an engineering or a macroscopic circuit point of view, the details of what sign the carriers have doesn't matter particularly much, and how many there are in my wire and so forth. Usually I'm just interested in the overall macroscopic behavior. So I might be interested in how the current density uh, depends upon the applied electric field. And then this proportionality constant is usually called sigma, which is another word, uh, a sigma, which is usually called the conductivity of the material. This is a material property. It's a property of the material that you can actually go out there and measure. And it's tabulated, whether your, your wire might be made out of copper or silver or gold. There's a, uh, you can look up values for this sigma. And if you want to know how sigma happens to be connected to the ma microscopic quantities in uh, the kind of model that I'm giving you here, uh, it's n times q squared over this uh, drag coefficient b, like so. Okay, so those conductivities you can, you can just go out and look up. People also tend to look at things a little bit differently. People like to talk about another quantity known as the resistivity. The way uh, that comes into the equation is you just kind of flip the equation around. You might want to write the electric field in terms of the current density. So people will also write E, they will just divide through by sigma and solve this equation. The current density J is proportional to the field, or in other words, the field is proportional to the current density. And that proportionality constant is called the resistivity. So E equals some constant times J, where rho then is the resistivity. And it's defined then, as you can see, it's just solving this equation. So it has to be one over the conductivity. Now, these names I hope you can see kind of make sense, right? If you have a high conductivity, then for any given electric field, you would have a huge amount of current would flow through your material if it's highly conductive. Conversely, if the conductivity is very high, then this definition giving you resistivity would then give you a very low resistivity for a highly conductive material. So 
we're now getting much closer to the, uh, to the final macroscopic view. These two equations can be very useful for you if you happen to know the, the properties of the material. But from a circuit point of view, we go up one higher level even. We generally don't think about uh, the current density, J. We just think about the total current. And also, we usually don't think about the electric field inside. We tend to focus on what is the voltage that's involved. So let's take this now here from our two key equations, and let's take this whole analysis then one step further to the final uh, macroscopic view. So let's keep these in view. But macroscopically then, if I want to go completely macroscopically, and I want to determine the uh, current that's flowing, remember here now the current is going to equal the current density dotted with the area through which I'm flowing. And that dot product, you know, gives you the magnitude of the current density times the magnitude of the area times the cosine of the angle between them. Now, if we look at our analysis, we know that the current density flows in the same direction as the electric field. And the electric field here is driving my current straight towards my surface. So the electric field vector points outward like this, just like the area vector does. So when I put those two vectors with their bases together, they're both pointing in the same direction. So the angle theta is actually fairly easy to calculate. It's the angle between this area vector, which was straight out, and this electric field vector. And so I'm trying to draw them slightly differently so we can see them, which is also straight out. And we want this angle here. But because these two vectors are in the same direction, of course, the angle then is 0. And if the angle is 0, the cosine then just gives me 1. So I don't have to worry about the cosine so much. The current density, J, we know then is uh, the conductivity sigma times the electric field. And the area, the magnitude of the area vector then, of course, is just the uh, area of my sample. So I have now uh, this result. And I've got the current now related to uh, a material property sigma. And I have it related uh, to the area of my wire, another macroscopic quantity. But the one kind of downside is, notice, I still have it in terms of the electric field, not the potential. But you'll remember that from the very beginning of my lecture, we had pointed out that we have a nice formula for relating the electric field to the potential, I mean to the voltage, right? If we happen to have a nice constant electric field like we were imagining here. So in that case, we know that the electric field um, is equal to the voltage, V, uh, divided by the length of the system. So we can put this all together, and we see then that the uh, current will be uh, equal to sigma, right? I'm trying to organize myself here, sigma. I'll, I'll factor out the electric field because I see, I mean, I'll factor out the voltage because I see current is proportional to voltage. But the proportionality constant is going to be sigma times V. So I'll write the V over here, right? Then uh, it's going to be sigma times V times A will go on top. And the final factor that, you, that we have is the uh, length uh, here on the bottom. So just to make sure I've accounted for everything, I took care of E because I had actually substituted in V over L. I've made sure to use my sigma here. I made sure to use my V here. And I certainly can see that I used A and I used L here for A and here for L. So current is actually proportional to voltage. That's a handy result. People actually turn this around a little bit and write it the other way. They get very interested in the voltage across my uh, conducting material in terms of the current. And you can see, because these are just constants, voltage is going to be the uh, directly proportional to the current. It's going to be the current times something. So 
So this is typically written as V equals IR, where now we have a very famous uh, formula. This R is known as the resistance. And this whole formula here is known as Ohm's law. And from our solution here, we can just finish off the algebra to determine what R is. If I solve this equation for V and put this quantity on the other side, I have to multiply by L and divide by sigma A. So this is equal to I, right, times L over sigma A. So I know then that the resistance R is L over sigma A, but this is a little awkward with the sigma on the bottom. Why not use the fact that we have up here that uh, one over sigma is the resistivity? That's why people actually like to define this thing. So the resistance then, when I substitute for one over sigma, I'll get a, a resistivity on top, is the resistivity times the length of the conductor divided by its cross-sectional area, another key result. So in here, we have two key results. We have Ohm's law, right? And we also have the formula here for resistance that you can use in Ohm's law for a particular conductor.